Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our monthly conversation here at the Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. Our conversation about racial healing and reconciliation. We've been blessed with a number of great speakers, and we have one tonight uh, who recently moved to Columbia University. Um, he's been at the University of Pennsylvania and other places. He is a professor of social policy uh, and is a, his graduate training was in social sciences and psychometrics. And he does work on intersections of the sociology of education, cultural studies, quantitative methods with critical interest in public policy. I can't think of a a better preparation for dealing with what's going on in our world right now. So we're really grateful to have you with us, uh, Professor uh, Dixon Roman. And with that, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, Dennis. Um, so I want to first start by um, extending my appreciation to you all for inviting me to join you today. Can you hear me fine? Um, and I should give a pre-warning, my son is here um, and he's 10 years old and he might come running in at any moment to say whatever, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> um, but also, I um, also want to give a land acknowledgement. Um, I am speaking from the land of the Lenape people um, here in the Hudson, in the New York City um, area. These are the traditional lands of the Lenape people from Valley area down to Delaware. Um, uh, um, and and um, with that acknowledgement, I also want to make sure uh, to pay homage to um, the history and ongoing legacy of settler colonialism that they have been at the hands of violence of and subjugated to um, and with the interest and hope of dreaming of new futures um, with them and working toward them with them. Um, and with that, so let me make sure I can share my screen. Right, so, um, okay, so I'm actually gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I actually have notes on my laptop at the same time. So I'm gonna, if it's all right, you all can see this, right? This is the slide, right? So okay, that's fine. Um, because I'm I need to also look at my my outline of notes at the same time. So please forgive me. But um so I I wanted to use this as an opportunity. Um, and also with the invitation I think William had um had extended to speak to. Um, uh, uh, some the recent uh, decision of, uh, on affirmative action, um, and use this as an opportunity not just to speak to the recent decision on affirmative action, but also place it in conversation in relation to the, um, what might be seamlessly disconnected. I'm going to make the argument is actually deeply connected, and that's the discourse um, and even material practices and in artificial intelligence and the ways in which they are um, playing out on the quotidian, literally in our um, uh, everyday lives. Um, and, um, and so I, I'll, I'm gonna make that turn um, in a little bit, but let me um, first begin by just saying a bit about myself, just to, um, I appreciate, the, thank you, Dennis, for the, for the introduction. Um, and I, I, I'd like to try to um, give a bit more background about myself so people are familiar with me. Um, uh, I'm a, I, I would character myself as a, characterize myself as a bit of an eclectic scholar um, and thinker. I don't come, have a traditional sort of trajectory where psychology and psychometrics and psychometrics, or for instance, someone who sociology or even philosophy for that matter. I'm one who's um, been rapidly interdisciplinary um, and goes after the questions. So while my 
Um, my undergraduate training was in psychology and Spanish. My the master's in psychology and master's in social sciences and my PhD in psychometrics out of the psychology department. Most of what I do is going after um, specific intellectual questions that pertain to the technologies and practices of quantification, the ways in which power is working in and through those very practices and processes, and especially logics of raciality, how they are working in and through the technology and the machine itself. Um, and what are the ways in which, if in understanding those technologies as part of a system, a, a techno social system, a system of sociality where the technology is deeply integrated and entangled with, what are the ways in which we might understand how um, those very technologies or apparatuses are shaping our lives um, or shaping the social? Um, and also with that, how to rethink them. So if we understand how um, these very technologies from educational test to artificial intelligence, how we can understand the ways in which they're limited, the ways in which they have their, um, the, the, the ways in which we might understand the various critiques of how power and, race, and raciality or race relations are reproduced through these systems. What are the ways in which we might rethink them, reimagine them, and redesign them alternatively toward shaping new futures? Um, so that's much of what I wrestle with, much of the types of questions I've gone after um, early on. Um, I was wrestling really with this question around how to think quantification, quantitative inquiry in relation to what's more broadly known as critical, critical theory. Um, and that's what brought me to this first book that I published called Inheriting Possibility, um, um, where I was theorizing and re-theorizing on theories of social production, that is to say how inequality and power is reproduced, but specifically in and through the very processes of quantification, while at the same time, how can we use quantification differently to analyze, understand, and recast. And so um, I bring this book up in particular right now because in the fourth chapter, I'm analyzing specifically the SAT. Um, it's not the first um, critical analysis I've done of, of the SAT. I actually worked at the college board as a research assistant for three years. Um, and as a result, had the um, weird thing to say, privileged opportunity to have access to college board data. Um, um, if you're not familiar, um, first of all, it's deeply difficult to get access to college board data. It's very difficult to, act, to get access to any college board related, whether it's AP test, test scores or SAT or PSAT scores, um, especially in relation to all of the other school data that they also collect in relation to those test scores. But when you do, you have access to what arguably is the population of test takers for that for those particular years. And so I was lucky enough to have access to the um, 2003 and 2004 um, years of SAT, of SAT scores. Um, and I should say cohort of, of SAT test takers. Back then, 20 years ago now, um, there was this question that Lonnie Guineer, the late Lonnie Guineer, had, had raised in the speech in 2001 uh, while at UC, I believe it was UC Santa Barbara, if I remember correctly, where she made the argument that the SAT was a wealth test. And it created a whole uproar of interest um, in the arguments and response to it from the college board, from from ETF um, and even from the field and even policymakers. Um, my, co my colleague and I at the, at the College Board decided we wanted to pursue this because there actually was no empirical data to suggest such thing, meaning, um, or to indicate that, meaning the only data that existed was correlation data between family income and SAT scores and parent education 
and SAT scores, each of which we knew to have a positive association. Yet we did not know what the association of family wealth was with SAT scores. Um, and, and part of there is a various reasons for this, um, including why we ultimately did not go after family wealth and SAT scores. And it's because the data is on family wealth is very difficult to get at. And the college board's data did not have, have it linked to it, did not have access to it. We had family income. Data. So what we wound up doing in this particular study was um, looking at um, race, poverty, and SAT scores. Um, this is a paper that wound up being published, I believe, in 2012 or 2013 in Teachers College Record. Um, and what we find is that not only does family income controlling for high school achievement, controlling for parent education, um, not only does us, not only does family income have a significant, a strong uh, association with SAT scores, but that it is twice the size. That is the magnitude of the association is twice the size for black test takers than it was for white test takers. And, and it was especially the case for test for black test takers from poverty. And so part of what we what we argue is that um, not only um, we couldn't say that Lana Guineer was right because we weren't exact, exact, necessarily examining family wealth in this particular what we say was that the previous study's estimates of the association of family income with SAT scores was underestimated. And that was the case, especially for black test takers. Um, and just to give you a sense, black, te black test takers coming from poverty, um, the difference between them and those coming and black test takers and, and excuse me, white test takers coming from the middle, from the median income, was almost a, um, a half of a standard deviation um, on, the, on the tool list. Literally enough to determine whether one gets into a selective institution or not. Um, this then had been, this work had been taken up by a number of, of legal teams, including one that went after the U UC systems use uh, requirement of college admissions tests. It ultimately was used to eliminate that requirement in the UC system. It also had been used in, other, in another case that was um, uh, recently lost against the, uh, New York State, um, seeking to go after the right to um, the right for an anti racist education. Um, and ultimately, that one, unfortunately, was thrown, was thrown out by the, by the, by the judge. Um, I don't want to go too, go too far off on that, on that tangent. So, but in chapter four, an inheriting possibility, I actually use a different data set where I, where I have measures of family wealth, specifically in a wide array of family wealth. Um, and what I find is that not only does family wealth specifically um, illiquid assets matter in relation to SAT scores, it matters over and above family income, um, uh, the, the parent's education, um, uh, whether the child, the, the test taker went to public or private school, um, a host of other, other factors, including out of school, out of school achievement opportunities. Um, and it mattered so much that it actually, um, the difference between having zero assets to having median, the median level, the 50th percentile mm -hmm. of assets um, was more than a half of, half of a standard deviation on the, on the SAT scale. Um, and so um, I would say this definitely suggested that at least the period of Lani Guineer definitely was onto something. I mean, we, and we intuitively had this sense, but whether we had the empirical data to demonstrate that, that was a whole nother thing. And hopefully this was the first empirical study in it that I, that I know of, I think still the only one out there that actually does look like family wealth. 
And the other part that matters to this is the out of school achievement was so deeply associated with Okay, why does all this matter <laughs> in relation to the decision last week? So um, the decision last week in relation to affirmative action rested on um, and and specifically, um, it's just a give us a reminder, the 14th Amendment um, states that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. All right. I want to rewind back a bit. So um, just as a reminder, 14th Amendment comes about in 1866, right? Um, passed by the Senate. And then um, in 1868, um, ratified two years later on, on, in 1868. Um, and the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to all persons or naturalized in the United States, including formerly enslaved people, and provided all citizens with equal protection under the laws, extending the provisions of the Bill of Rights to the states. This is really, I think this is really important. And also, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to say curious. Um, Curious as to why they would even why the Supreme Court would go back to the Fourteenth Amendment to go after this to use for this particular ruling, um, and and the reason being is because so first of all, I mean obviously, Fourteenth Amendment brings about certain rights for those freed slaves, right? So already you, the, it, it's the the Supreme Court is using. A, an amendment that was used to provide um, rights, citizenship, um, um, even um, the, the opportunity to, to full, um, um, full citizenship within the, within the US, while at the same time going after the, uh, another later law that came, that came about as a result of the 14th Amendment as well, um, that came about as a way of trying to write, if you will, I'm gonna put in quotations, right, or redress history of inequity, the history of racial subjugation, and arguably ongoing inequities, right? Um, racial inequities that we knew and that we know exist within the institutions of society. So I think what's really important here is that what the Supreme Court did here was rest on a, what I would characterize as a logic of equality, but not equity, right? So equal protection under the law. That is, this decision was based on providing equal treatment of all people and not based on seeking to address prior inequities, both in the history of the United States race relations and by way of ongoing racial inequities within institutions and society. Just to be clear, inequalities about treating people or groups or communities the same, providing equal treatment, inequity is not necessarily about equality, but it's inequity about actually trying to provide the necessary treatments, the necessary conditions, the necessary responsive policy regulations and provisions in order to enable um, a just, and even I would, I would even characterize full human development, full human potential.
although they use the 14th Amendment to overturn affirmative action, I would argue this was a misreading of what affirmative action was actually about. So affirmative action was not about a logic of equality, but rather a logic of equity. Affirmative action sought to redress historical inequities as well as ongoing inequities in institutions and society. So now granted, affirmative action comes about, so this is part of the issue of the law. Literally, what I mean by the issue of the law, the issue of the logic of the law and precedent. So part of the part of how affirmative action even comes about is a result of the 14th Amendment. In fact, I think there's an important piece here that we need to actually be quite concerned about. The 14th Amendment granted Congress the power to enforce um, this amendment and provision that led to the passage of other landmark legislation in the 20th century, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I would argue that we should be very nervous of many other legislative provisions and regulations that enable or protect our rights to be potentially in threat. If they can go after this, using the 14th Amendment, there's always the open window. There's now the open window to go after other, other protections. A number of people have raised the question, why just race conscious? Why not gender conscious? Why not class conscious? In this particular case that we're going after race conscious, who's to say that the next case will be going after gender conscious or even class conscious? Um, so I, I think um, what, what I, um, I think what's deeply what's deeply problematic about the decision last week is the leveling and making a decision that is, in fact, illogical to the purposes, really, of, of the social policy of affirmative action, seeking to redress and create equity, going after it based on an amendment, based on a logic of equality. Um, and as long as a logic of equality is used, on measures and mechanisms of equity, there's always going to be issues. There's always going to be tensions. Equity and equality are always incongruent. Um, all right, so why does this matter for artificial intelligence? So, there's at least two things that I want to I want to raise here um, in relation to artificial intelligence, and I was actually going to go through a whole case study and share a whole case study with you all, but I'm for the sake of time, I won't, I'll, I'll I'll save you save you all from that. But um, so there's two things that that um, this I think has this decision has potentially deep implications for. So one. Um, when training, um, when, when considering how a race is interacting or has implications in relation to AI or vice versa, we have to first understand how AI as a technology both is designed, um, implemented, and deployed. Um, artificial intelligence is an umbrella term for a number of different technologies. Um, one in which, uh, is, which is probably the more dominant one right now is in the area of machine learning. Machine learning is an umbrella term for a number of different, um, really, which is, um, the basic idea of machine learning is um, you have um, some, uh, some specified form of algorithm um, that, trained on a set of data. So literally you have some, some set of, uh, of data that you're, that you're working with. You train that algorithm on that data. 
And basically what that means is you're, param you're using that data to parameterize, come up with, to, to, to literally activate the model of this algorithm. And then that algorithm is then um, 15 years old. For those of you that are more familiar, please read my gross description here. But, um, but then that algorithm is then um, uh, cross-validated and then implemented on unreal, on actual data. Um, you have different forms of algorithms, some that are specifically seeking to predict a specific outcome of interest, which are known as supervised, supervised uh, machine learning models. And then there are those that are um, not seeking to predict any particular um, uh, outcome, but um, in fact um, are literally allowing the data to, um, the patterns in the data to drive the estimation of the model, including it might be to, it, it, it literally could be to actually identify what the potential outcomes might be, what the potential categories might be. Um, and that's known as an unsupervised model. Um, we come across the unsupervised models often when we go on um, Amazon or even in Facebook, when we're getting these recommendations for things. Those recommendations are based on an unsupervised machine learning algorithm that's learning from our interactions with it. And also it's, all the data, all of the data that it's um, been uh, of others' interactions as well. Um, well, part of um, part of what happens in this process is one, we have some, as I mentioned, some set of training data. Well, there's a decision on how we what becomes the data that we train it on, and the decisions that we make. On what data to train it on is 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 in fact an ethical political decision on its own. We are making decisions on what to include and what not to include. Um, we're making decisions on what data is of good quality, what data is not of good quality. And what we also are making decisions on is whether we include certain categories, certain um, um, group category labels like race and um, The other part to this, which is something that I've, I've argued is that um, we both know this theoretically and empirically that all data is in some form or fashion, in some form or degree associated with other social categories of different race, gender, class, all data collected is some degree associated with COVID or correlated to some degree with, with, with these various social categories. It is literally because of the social nature of, our, of, our, of the world we live in. Um, so when we train an algorithm, on any set of data, regardless whether we include race ethnicity in there or not, what winds up happening is there are other variables in that data set that serve as proxies because of their correlation with race ethnicity that then become built into, become part of the very parameterization of the algorithm. Okay, so literally becoming built into the logic in the estimation of the algorithm itself is race ethnicity. The other part to this is when the algorithm, even before the algorithm, even, even before the algorithm is even trained on the data, in any algorithm, we're making decisions on defaults. Right, so we make a decision on whether there is a default setting on um, what kind of rotation we might give to the matrix of the data, of the from the data, the actual matrix, in order to, this is done in, in, in most algorithms, in order to bring greater 
clarity, if you will, in the clustering or in the estimation. Um, and in certain algorithms, for instance, you know, what's known as a clustering algorithm, um, there are always different forms of rotations. Some rotations of beam association, some rotations of beam complete orthogonality, meaning that they're not associated at, at all. Well, in any of these decisions, we're making an ethical political decision and we're making a decision that's making assumptions about the, the social world that we live in. Well, if we assume complete orthogonality, that is to say that they're not associated, that means when we're estimating, for instance, in, a, in the education setting, a category of behavior, such as, and I'm gonna be crude here, such as good behavior, those students behaving well, those students who need behavioral remediation. And we're assuming that they are completely not correlated, that their behaviors are completely not correlated, and which means there's no continuum between them. There's no variability between them. They are literally, we can understand these, these groups being constructed by the algorithm as essential groups in the social world, natural, almost naturalized. And place that in association with the training of the algorithm where race ethnicity is being built right into it. The very logics and associations of race ethnicity or gender or class are being built right into it. That means that the categories that wind up getting algorithmically produced are also being based on those very assumptions, those very estimations. So the likelihood that you get more groups associated with, certain, with, with different categories, with different behavioral categories is almost, you can almost be sure about it. Unless there are other safeguards being used. Then the other part of this is how we interact with the output how we as humans interact with the output itself. So as a teacher or a social worker, um, a lawyer, depending on whom it, whomever it is, how we interact, how the judge interacts with the predictive risk assessment of, an, of, of, a, of, a, def, of a defendant. Um, when, they're being, when they're being predicted to be at high risk of, of committing another violent offense, does the judge say, I'm, they're they're going to make a decision to give them a, a lower um, um, decision or ruling, um, or are they going to give them a harder ruling because they're being at, because the algorithm is, is indicating that they're at a higher risk of committing a new violent offense? All right. I think what's important here is that the um, what the what this decision of affirmative action has the implications to do is on the one hand, um, not it literally create a, 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 a potential practice of not using, not just not just using race as a feature or a variable in the models, but not accounting for it at all. So um, we know that predictive analytics are being used in admissions. All these colleges that have gotten rid of test scores that have moved to test optional or not requiring college admissions tests, and including some of the, many of the ones that are using college admissions tests, they are using predictive analytics. They are using a form of machine learning algorithm to predict one, whether the student will finish, will complete within four to six years, Two, what their first year GPA will be. And three, what their final, what their final cumulative GPA potentially will be. They have been using features or, or variables, predictors, such as if the applicant is a Pell Grant recipient, they've been using race ethnicity. They've been using the high school that they've come from. They've been using zip code. Guess what? All these 
are going to predict, we already know this, they're going to predict the Pell Grant recipient is less likely to finish within four to six years. We know this. The, um, uh, those coming from underrepresented racial backgrounds are going to be less likely to finish within four to six years than their counterparts. We know this. This is already empirically known. Zip code, the distance, the further distance you are away from the institution, especially for those coming from low, lower income backgrounds, are less likely to finish. Already known. Yet they're building it into the models. They're building it into the models for admission. So, on the one hand, um, and, and so okay, let me one more one more point, and then I'm I'm gonna shut up because I know we're I've gone longer than I was supposed to. But um, this decision says you can't use race. So okay, now they won't use race ethnicity in those predictive models. But guess what? All these other proxies that are being used in the model, zip code, high school, Pell Grant recipient, gender, each of them will predict, will, put, will make up for the predictive power of race ethnicity. And as a result, even though race ethnicity may not be used as a predictor, it still will come through in and through the other variables of the model. And so what you get is an algorithmic form of colorblindness. Um, and on the flip side, because this decision says there can be no race conscious um, admissions decisions, they can't mitigate it on the other end. They can't find, they can't develop measure, if you will, they can't develop, Figure out, they can't develop practices that explicitly uses race as a way to try to mitigate what that what many of these missions offices they know they understand this. So the implications that this has for artificial intelligence, I think, is 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 actually deep, and this is just in relation to specifically in college admissions. I'm not. I, I didn't even speak to necessarily how I actually think it has deeper implications for the everyday where we're constantly interacting with our group. But I'm, I'm gonna stop on that. Thank you all. Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> you gotta unmute, uh, William. No, I have to unmute. While he's doing that, I did want to, we had a speaker a few months ago, um, Al Barlow, he's an attorney here in um, Florida. And he uh, got all of the data on sentencing to show that um, black uh, individuals, convicts were, um, had different uh, sentences than white. Um, now, now this is, I, I haven't researched it or found out what's going on, but apparently now judges are using the same data to decide what uh, the sentence should be. And I can only imagine some of the assumptions and defaults that you're talking about have ended up in there. I think your work is great. I, I think it's uh, um, that's something 
we all have to learn about because um, AI is moving fast and uh, um, in some ways it it may be too late to put the genie you know back in the bottle so I, 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 go ahead no I, I I was gonna say I like to characterize it as um, the train has left the station and mm -hmm. Congress has been asleep behind the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the Supreme Court understood the things you've been talking about tonight. <laughs> I, you know what, though, William, honestly, I hate to put it this way, but I'm not so sure how much they care. I think it was very much a political and ideological agenda driving this, this court. Um, and and I and I, you know, what what I was going to say earlier to in when I was talking about the amendment and all of that, um, we need a serious reckoning in the country, um, especially in relation to government. Um, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about how. Um, the Supreme, so first of all, you know, there's the, there's the process in which this Supreme Court becomes constituted and really arguably can be pointed to one particular um, uh, figure um, and that held, both held things up and pushed things along in order to, in, to create this constitution of, of this Supreme Court. And, and that's, that was um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Remember? He held, up, held, held things up, but even despite what Obama had put forward, nominated someone, held it up for over a year. Because he believed the next president should have had the opportunity to appoint uh, the, 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 Supreme, the next Supreme Court justice. Um, but then on the, on, the, on the other end of things, he rushed it along at the end, literally in a few months. He rushed it along to get that the new appointment through before uh, the last term, before Trump's last um, end of his of, of his term. And so, I, I you know, I, I not you know, of course, you know, I don't think it's any just one person. It's always a confluence of forces and relations and organizations that make these things happen. That. Um, uh, I do believe there's also asymptotic responsibility where people should be held accountable. With that said, um, I also do strongly believe there's certain, there's unquestionable um, evidence and documentation of how certain Supreme Court justices have been in relationship, in conversation, influenced by, even receiving money from particular donors that have particular political interests and how they can remain, okay, remain on the court, how they can be able to be included in the decisions that, per, that are associated with those relationships is deeply troubling, deeply troubling. Um, so I, 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 sorry, it's a long way of <laughs> responding to your, to your point. <laughs> Were you gonna say something else, William? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just I agree with what you're saying. I appreciate it. I'm really glad you're here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, we here in Florida are dealing with very subjective decision making on the part of the legislature and the governor. And it's designed to, you know, get votes from a certain group. And it, it's a challenge. Um, uh, what you just talked about, if you were teaching at the University of Florida or 
you know, and if you'd be gone, you'd yeah. be out the door because all it would take is one person to complain that their son felt guilty when you brought up this issue and then that would it would start and they've taken over control of essentially taken over control of tenure uh at the board level so uh yeah that's a interesting time here i i um I actually meant to to um, bring this up earlier. So my new appointment at Columbia actually would not be. So I'm professor of critical race, media, and educational right. stuff. That it just yeah. it would not be in Florida. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but I, I, yeah. I, I do want to. Um, we have just five minutes, but I do want to highlight uh, what you your your this, the thesis you laid out. And how important it is for people to look at that. Um, there are opportunities to see AI in action. Um, if you're a teacher, certainly a professor, uh, if you're a lawyer, uh, anybody that's trying to write something, you can go online now and get all the argument you want, you know, and it's. Uh, but you've done something even more important, and that is showing how data can be used in a way that uh, is not the best for our society. And hopefully uh, your works can, uh, in some ways I think of it as uh, the uh, manual of uh, diagnostic and statistical disorders. We need a, uh, a handbook or a guide on AI mm. and its application mm. to war warning signs that this use of this data this way could cause X. And it's just, I, I've actually worked on this many years ago when I was at Berkeley. Uh, we had an AI uh, product and uh, I was shocked to find out <laughs> that in all the years that um, have gone by since then, the model is no different. It's just a matter of loading in and determine relevancy, you know, adjacency in terms of the subject matter. Uh, and uh, I always thought that there was some magical mathematical algorithm. Certainly it, it is there, but it's really just uh, building the biggest tree you can uh, and linking it as as well as you can, which is very helpful. I mean, I use it all the time for different things. Um, I argue with with whoever, the, the, the entity <laughs> sometimes, but. Uh, well, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I want to make sure that I always try to do this because I, I sometimes can um, think I can be uh, read and interpreted as, as, as overly critical. But you know, I, I'm not well, not arguing we need to go back to some pre-modern moment either. I, I I am suggesting that there are ways of engaging the technology, ways of engaging the data um, with ethical and political intention. Yeah. Right. Right. No. No question about it. And again, Al Barlow's approach. Yeah, right. It's just we have to watch and make sure people don't flip it and uh, use it uh, the wrong way. But yeah. Any other questions for uh, Professor Dixon? When's your next book coming out? <laughs> um, actually, there's um, one un somewhat more unrelated to this that just came out um, within the past month with Third World Press called Black Radical Love. It's a tribute to my um, longtime mentor, Professor Edmund W. Gordon, who arguably is the, um, the uh, eminent figure, if you will, on educational equity of the 20th century. And, and on. He was a student of Du Bois and Elaine Locke and um, has, has influenced, mentored many of us and we, we pulled this book together as a tribute to him on his 102nd birthday. Yeah. Uh, 
but um, but the other, but my, the book that I'm working on now um, probably won't be out until 2025. That's just the the turnaround when it comes to academic presses and all, but. Um, it will be, it's titled currently Haunting Algorithms, and I'm specifically going after the logic and philosophy of, um, of cybernetics and machine learning and AI, and it's in tracing its connections to the Enlightenment and colonialism. I'm excited about it, but uh, it, it it's it's quite a it's been quite an undertaking and project. It's 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 fun work, um, but it, it's just it's going to be. It's, unfortunately, I have you'll have to wait two two more years for it. <laughs> there are I do have articles out there if you like if you like I'm happy to share them. Well, thank you again for joining us tonight. This was a great uh, presentation. As I said, we'll put it on YouTube for others that uh, would like to hear. And uh, we'll send you a link. Uh, so if you want to share it with others. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like Dawn might have a question or. Yes, I do. Ah, go ahead, Dawn. First, I want to thank you for being here tonight and speaking on this topic. It's very, very important. And I sincerely appreciate it. And for everyone who held it tonight, I, I thank you as well. I would like to make a comment and then I have a few questions really quick. Um, what's so important about what you said um, about AI and how it's designed will have a negative impact on certain populations as we know. Another thing too, the hiring practices, because a lot of times we're not represented in the technology fields anyway. So if you have a group of people who already feel a certain way and can design the AI, and the technology in a way that's not gonna be beneficial to other groups. That's gonna be a problem and a lot that we're gonna to have to unpack. So if the, hire, if the company now doesn't have to consider race, really affirmative action really is to affirm an action of fairness. It really isn't even just about race alone anyway. So if you don't have something in the environment where there should be some form of accountability and these ideas are gonna come into the methods and the ways that they can apply it, in the technology, it's going to be very far reaching and very hurtful because the whole environment will be designed against groups of people, which will eventually go back and hurt the people who created it in the first place. Because fairness doesn't just end up at one door and it doesn't just knock one door down. And I tell everybody when you're in, as long as you are living, you are going to end up in a group that's going to be discriminated against. And that's the aging population. Mm -hmm. You're going to get there. You may be young, you may be male, female, white, whatever it is. You will, if you continue to live, you're going to get impacted by the rules and the policies that you're creating, particularly if it's negative. They just don't think so because it's just the other people. But I, what my question is, uh, um, if I can get some information. And also I was starting my own little crusade, I guess, in um, AI and technology and the law. I'm not going to school for it, just doing my own research. But if I can assist you in any way in your endeavors, I'll be more happy to do so because I know you probably need people to research things for you, send you information and things like that. And you're way ahead of where I am but I surely have the skills where I can support you and I would be more than happy to do so. Oh, I, I, I deeply appreciate that, Don. Um, uh, I'll put my email in the chat box and, um, and would encourage you to please shoot me an email and we can connect, um, uh, I was gonna say offline, but maybe via another line. I don't know, <laughs> we can connect uh, after this. Sure. Um, that'll be and, fine. I'm, I'm also happy to connect you with some additional resources that of, of colleagues, um, even a center that I'm affiliated with um, that do work specifically in law and technology. Um, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a center at Penn that my colleague, um, Christopher Yoon um, founded and um, it's all on like, it's like innovative, innovative technology and the law, something like that. Um, but, um, 
but I, I'll send you, I can send you all these resources. Um, and I wanna extend also that invitation to anyone, everyone else too. Please do feel free to reach out to me um, if, you, if you're interested in other resources or have um, questions that you might come up with later on. Um, one thing I do wanna um, mention is, so there's a, a couple things, a couple things. One is hiring practices, absolutely. Um, we already, there's work being or being done around this. Um, my colleague, um, my, uh, and, um, oh my gosh, I blank, Joanna Marinescu, um, she's an economist, does public and labor economics, um, got a lot of attention years ago based on her work on um, uh, basic income and, um, I think it's called labor market concentration. I mean, she basically got Amazon in trouble for the practices that they're doing and in, in literally um, creating labor market concentration and then suppressing the wages in, the, in those local labor markets. Um, but I also know she's been doing work on um, the use of, of algorithms in hiring practices. Um, and this is, you know, this is an interesting area too because there's the there's the work that goes back, I think, 20, at least 20 years now that was based on a name, right? So we're sending resumes out and um, uh, and randomly assigning um, racial ethnic names to those resumes. And, 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 and uh, lo and behold, who were the ones who were most likely to get the callbacks um, um, was, was there was a racial distribution. Um, the, um, uh, Dennis, the, the, this, as, as Dawn was talking, I was reminded of the point that you mentioned about standards for AI. Deeply important, and I'm, I'm so glad that you brought it up because um, there are, I'm working on a project now um, so that we're seeking to understand how school district administrators and school administrators are using evidence to adopt educational technology, so platforms within their school. So unlike testing, there are standards with testing, right? Uh, so literally laid out guidelines and standards for validity, reliability, equity concerns and all. That doesn't exist for technology, for ed tech platforms. And it literally is like the wild, wild west out here. Principles, uh, school district administrators, have they don't have any guidance for how to adopt these, make decisions on how to adopt these platforms, nor are there any regulations for what needs to be specified. So they could be sold a platform that's based on all internal research and equity not even being a concern in, 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 at all. So this is one of the things that we are taking up. Um, and is also, there is a broader conversation around this as yeah. well. There is, uh, we have to, we, we always promise people we'll close by eight o'clock. Um, otherwise, they won't want to come. <laughs> but I, there is something called Quality Matters. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's um, a set of criteria for uh, educational technology LMS systems mm -hmm. that may, you know, that may extrapolate or be a parallel to something you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, before we close, I did want to recognize a couple of people that joined us right at the end. Uh, Jocelyn Turner, who is head of our guild at the Jacksonville Urban League and also very active in uh, public health in the community. And uh, Dr. Rogers Kane, former president of the Northeast Florida Medical Society. Uh, and the two of them, I suspect they're here because they're going to ask you to be on their um, program. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, Dennis, can I, uh, you know, I, I actually was listening through Facebook and then um, at the last minute, Jocelyn said, hey, if you want to get in on the, because I couldn't do anything but type in, you know, uh, through the chat box, type in some concerns and questions and comments. Uh, but I, you, you're absolutely correct. I would love to have a gentleman on our 
um, uh, podcast. podcast. Yeah. We're we are actually doing talking about this subject this coming Tuesday at six thirty, uh, in which we have a uh, a couple of local people, uh, attorneys, uh, to address this. And one of them may be actually the you know the uh, the gentleman the attorney you spoke of early earlier, Rodney. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just blanking on his last name. But I would like to say this before we uh, before we get off real quick. It, this was an excellent presentation. Uh, I think uh, and I feel how the even morons can take uh, artificial intelligence and use it against uh, even the smartest of people uh, to, uh, to to prevent the equalization in our society. And so I think what we really need to do is everyone really need to pay a whole lot of attention to what this young man, and I'm old enough to say young man, this young man has referenced in his uh, literature and you know in his writings. I would love for him to at least put in the chat box again his book. I would like to be able to get a chance to read the current book. Boy, and I wish he could speed up that next one because it is more <laughs> it, it is really needed. Uh, yesterday in terms of what it, it sounds like its contents is going to be. So thank you for, you know, um, this education on my part. And I'm looking forward to your next book, hopefully a lot more speedier than 2025. <laughs> but <laughs> but I really uh, expect to enjoy. It. Thank you, sir. And I, I did want to also recognize uh, Raven Countryman, our uh, intern coordinator. Without the interns, we wouldn't be able to have this program. Uh, and Neil Garza, who's one of our uh, new interns this summer. And finally, William Malone, who really was responsible for getting you here. So thank you, William. And he's the driver behind uh, this program. Well, you all have a great evening and a great weekend. And uh, Look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you all. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, well, let us know when you come to town. I, I, I most certainly will. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Yep, yep. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.